she has a remarkable understanding of institutions and politics, so she would not be unfamiliar, I guess, within a couple of weeks of the challenges of political economy that we deal with very much in, in this country. And I, you know, I think she's going to be touching on a very important question, um, both for this country and, of course, uh, for South Africa, uh, which has made a tremendous journey over the last 20 plus years. And Sue and many other colleagues from her generation have been part of the struggle, so to speak, before the transition in 94, and subsequently in dealing with a very entrenched system, which we practice in other forms here. Uh, of apartheid planning and a whole range of other economic systems and processes. So that's, I guess, a reflection inside out. This is, a, this is an important set of questions, especially in India's current context, both because our cities are not fair. In fact, you know, one of our ongoing debates here is whether we are more effective practitioners of apartheid planning in our cities without calling it so than the South Africans have been for a long time. If you look at the way things are going, uh, ghettoization, exclusion, and a whole range of other processes. But also given the current uh, political environment and the questions that are being asked about our democracy and, you know, um, and the way it's functioning, I think this is an important question to deal with. Plus in the global debate, there are other framings, framings around the right to the city, which uh, are sort of catching up in some ways. So we have a very rich environment. Uh, today I had to answer questions about adaptive cities. Yesterday it was smart cities. I think uh, as, as a framing, uh, looking at fairness, equity, uh, justice, inclusion uh, are questions that we need to engage with quite actively. So I'm going to ask Sue to go for it. She's a wonderful speaker. She'll also provoke you with lots of interesting ideas and questions. Uh, and we're very glad to have her, have her here over this week and hope we can close with this. Thanks, Sue. All yours. Your life. Um, but you will hear in some time to come, um, hopefully because Lustro Urban Futures, this logo that you see here, uh, will be landing up having a bit more of a presence and an engagement with you uh, here in Bangalore. Cape Town is already what we call a local inter interaction platform, um, which is something that I, I was involved in the design of. We, our equivalent to IIHS, the African Center for Cities, you can also have a look at it on the website, um, runs a program of what we call embedded researchers, okay, where we literally have taken researchers who spend up to seven months at a time in a partnership with the city of Cape Town. Um, and the logic there is simply that we need to learn from practice. We're thinking of extending that into some civil society organizations, uh, and then they come back into the academy, and we try and work very consciously on, on issues which may not yet be in the academic domain, either because we haven't acknowledged the problem, or because the solutions may lie outside of the academy. So it's a very large, a fairly large program. It operates in other cities. And this paper was commissioned as part of an attempt to think about what made for the Mistra difference. Uh, in other words, what joined all these things? What was this idea of co-production of embedded researchers going to give us? How do we think about the interface between theory and practice? And so three papers were commissioned, one on green by somebody called Simon Marvin. Many of you may know his work uh, on fragmented urbanism. Um, the, the, the fair one, which is what you've got before you, and then one from a colleague in Gothenburg on, on dense cities, which is a very difficult topic, it turns out, because, of course, not everybody thinks dense is good in the same way. And, in fact, that we'll see, um, I'll, I'll talk about for fair. So the questions that were, I was trying to address, so this is what is coming, in a sense, is so what does the fair city mean for legitimate theory and for workable practice? Okay. So it's got to be, in a sense, it's got to be for both. How does co-production of knowledge shape the meaning we give the fair city? In other words, when we really genuinely listen and think not in purely philosophical terms, but when we actually engage with practice, what does it mean? And then how can we accommodate these totally different contexts? So some of our colleagues work in Gothenburg, okay, in Sweden. This is not the same as our other colleagues who work in Kisimu, which is a secondary city in Kenya. So how do we talk about what is a fair city? Uh, and then how do we link fair, green, and dense into a single, somewhat more coherent agenda of urban transformation? Now, these slides that I'm showing you here were prepared almost two years ago. 
these first ones. So you'll see the resonance with where we're going to come to in terms of some of the bigger debates that are on the table uh, at, at the moment. So I started off with that quote that you saw in the abstract by saying, well, for me, what is, what is fairness? Okay. And, and, and my definition, this is me speaking, was that it shouldn't really matter whether you were born in India or in the Philippines or in Finland. It also shouldn't matter whether you were born a man or a woman, whether you were born straight or gay. It, your life choices really shouldn't make the difference. And we all know that that's not the case. Okay. And so then from there, it was this question of saying, so how does this stuff manifest? How is it built? How is it managed? And what is it that we should really be doing if we want to reshape the urban future in, in different kinds of ways? Uh, how does our conceptual understanding of fairness advance what we might do? Okay? So um, it's, it's not just that I'm saying ideas inform practice. I'm saying practice informs ideas. But I, it, this has to be a circular process. Okay? Um, and so we start from this thing, which I think everybody in the room would agree, is that cities are not fair. Um, unambiguously, if you're a woman, and we might argue that gender, we were arguing that earlier, that gender is perhaps one of the fundamental cleavages of inequality, the way that we differentially experience uh, the urban form. The difficult thing, though, is not that we, we all agree that it's unfair, but if we were to go around the room, we would not agree on what it meant to be unfair. Okay, and I love this cartoon. Okay. I don't know which side, you know, maybe I shouldn't ask you because you'll, well, maybe you will. Which side do you think is the version of fairness? Who's for the one on the left? No? One on the right? Okay, consensus in this room, not in every room. Okay, lots of people think that if you are simply giving everybody some kind of assistance, that's fair, right? Equal assistance. Is it the input or the outcome that is important, important in those kinds of ways? We already talked about how, in beginning to start problematizing this, it was really important that whether you're looking at Google Scholar for the abstract conceptual work or whether you were looking in city policy documents, we needed to have some kind of resonance. We couldn't have different kinds of ideas and different practices. I want to start with ideas. And the reason that I want to start with ideas is that, as a scholar, <coughs> I'm absolutely of the conviction that ideas about cities, it matters what you think. Okay? It does matter what you think. Because ideas about cities travel, the idea of the guidance to be on the left, you can see when you walk outside of the door, the public sphere would be absolutely delighted with much of what is going on in the current context at the moment. And we know that those ideas, which come from a previous generation, have got fixed in place and will be lived for an inherited generation. But ideas really matter. The problem is with ideas is that there are many of them. Um, and so they matter simultaneously. Kind of, you know, you, you get different passions happening, not just sequentially, but also at the same time. So if you think about people like Marx and Engels, who wrote very explicitly about the city, okay, both about cycles of investment uh, and about how you might organize the working class and about very particular sexual issues like whether or not home ownership was important. Those theorists were absolutely foundational to how we think about the city. Similarly, Weber, probably one of, at the moment, the most underrated theorists on the city, that spoke explicitly to the question of bureaucracy. Okay? And we're sitting in a country as is mine, where how bureaucracy works, and we'll talk about that later, is really important. And theoretically, Weber's really useful for that process. Other kinds of theorists of a different kind who put the focus on people, people like Jane Jacobs uh, or Louis Wood, the organization of social systems, organization of cultural practices, and the other form, and the way that that is organized. So we either get overtly theoretical or political theorists, one kind of ideas, or, I don't know if any of you are, are architects or, or, or planners, I imagine there are quite a few of you in the room, we get practice-based ideas. So, whether we're talking about Howard and Garden Cities or Wright and, and the origins of, of, of and the push for home ownership in the suburbs, uh, look, we said this very well known theorist coming back into fashion in a way, very practice oriented. But it was an ideas based practice. Okay? So for me, that distinction between theory and practice is actually not as big, 
sometimes uh, as we make it out to be. I want to stick on this interface, but in, in, in a sense what I'm doing here is really, really asserting that, that the academy matters. Okay? It's, 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 and because the academy matters, we do have to navel gaze. And if we just stop simply to think about what we've learned from our five second review, and if we had a much longer process of, of intellectual reflection, that link between values, that normative base, investment, design, management, any element, protest, identity, all can be traced to strong philosophical traditions, to strong normative kinds of traditions. But we also note that values change. Not only are they multiple, but they do change over time. Okay? And, then, and they change both in response to and also in reaction to pushback. Uh, quite often urban. So the ideas that get traction, in other words, the ideas that get taken up, it seems to me, are the ones that either find a political purchase or are not opposed. Okay? So it, just because an idea gets a, a, a political purchase doesn't necessarily mean it's a good one. It may simply mean that no one's opposing it. And sometimes that happens because it's got so embedded in how we do things I mean, we are, are urbanists that may literally be in the physical form. The suburb, for me, would be one of those. If you think about who's the most powerful theorist, in some senses, of, of the contemporary urban condition, in some ways, it is not the Kobe okay? It is probably right, um, in all sorts of ways. So that's the one thing. The other thing is, is that, and many of you will be following this debate at the moment, is that ideas are not universal. They are contested, and they're unambiguous that there's a huge debate raging at the moment about whether we should have one normative base or not. Now, the tricky part about this is that the notion of fairness is a universal notion. How do you argue that what is fair for somebody in Bangladesh is different from what is fair for somebody in Stockholm? Go back to that early picture. Okay. In other words, do all cities have to be fair in the same way? Do we have to have a universal minimum? Is that where we're drawing the line on what is fair? I think we're not clear. Um, and it's a really, really important kind of concern when we start to think of the fundamentally different conditions which we are responding to. That fairness, I'll talk about it but a slide on it later, is not just about what's fair for us today, it's also what's fair for future generations. So it's not just the geographical fairness it's or the sexual fairness, it's also the temporal question of what's there. The biggest thing that we face in our contemporary discussion of this is that there really are, let's go back to that earlier slide, such different conditions pertaining. So these are simply growth rates, and you know the red ones are the really fast-growing ones, and the blue ones are the slow-growing ones. And that's a euphemism for the kinds of challenges that you are facing. If we use the north-south kind of question, what are the sorts of conditions and what, would, what are we responding to in trying to make these cities fairer in particular ways? And some people are arguing that Jenny Robinson, for example, would say all cities are the same, I, or all cities are different. Other people are saying, no, 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 no. There is an explicit, and Anya Roy's work to some extent talks about the Asian city. Okay? There's a specificity to this thing. Uh, some people would argue uh, Stop has just argued that all cities are the same. They're fundamentally about an economy. There's nothing fundamentally different. There's, it's the urbanness that you have to respond to, not the context. My own view, in part summarized here, is that I think that there really are real differences. They're not hermetically sealed. There's overlap. There's some continuity. The north is in the south. The south is in the north. But to pretend that the kinds of challenges that are evident in Peru are exactly the same sorts of challenges that are evident in Switzerland doesn't take us very far theoretically and conceptually. And so the list that you have on the table is some attempt to begin to start distilling the essence of these sorts of things. And if you take a point like on the global south here, elite resistance to increased redistribution, that's true in the north, but it's true at scale in the global south. So for me, it would be a question of scale and 
uh, emphasis. And thinking about what that means, and perhaps the most important one here, and we were again talking about this this morning, is that the meaning of gender in cities of the global south is so fundamentally different from the meaning of gender in the cities of most Western democracies that I think to not problematize what that means and how that manifests in our thinking about fairness takes us to the wrong entry point. So I think as a clearinghouse, one of the things we have to be able to do is to understand our context. What is the challenge to fairness? What makes it unfair? Both internally and then vis-a-vis -vis other places. And so what I'm not saying is that the fairness is relative, the fairness is utterly different in each city. I'm also pointing to the fact that we need some resonance of fairness across all cities, okay, if we're going to get there. And so this is a very complicated dialogue. It's not just about fixing Bangalore. It's about Bangalore relative to every other Indian city, where you guys come out pretty close to the top of the pile. But it's also about the condition of urban life in India relative to that of Germany. So we've got, we've got a lot of work to do. One of the things which I think does help us is that at least as a starting point, there has been, it's very clear, that there are some common problems which help us to begin to start thinking about. One is enduring poverty and inequality. In other words, nobody is off the hook. I don't think we can point to a fair city. So everybody is thinking about it. And that means we can learn something from each other. Similarly, every city, it seems to me, especially in the 21st century, is characterized by some form of fragmented governance. It may be much worse in Uganda than it is in a whole lot of other places, and much more complex. And I will go on to argue that, in fact, this is one of the things that sets aside the city of the global south. But everybody faces this problem. And that helps us to develop a language for what we have to begin to do. And similarly, I think everybody faces the challenge. And here we perhaps aren't quite as challenged as our colleagues in North America, Australia, <coughs> South Africa, uh, in what we are doing for future generations. Uh, but it, it means that there's, some, there's work to be done. OK, so then the question is, is what do we do? Well, the first thing I would argue is that in global <coughs> terms, partly simply because of population, our focus should be on Africa and Asia. The first imperative, because that's where most of the world's population lives, is to address fairness and unfairness in Asian and African people. The second is that this is good news because actually this is the one place where things are changing so far, but in a direction that is helpful, that we can begin to do some things which are different. In other words, there's a space for innovation. I really like this diagram. I use it quite often. It's a pointer. <coughs> yeah. This is the square we're interested in. And all this is saying is, have a look at, at this is a, just a fragmentation. Oh, I think you've got some lovely versions of the same sort of thing. So here is all rural areas of population. Okay. Here are emerging markets, if that's a term you like, and here are the least developed markets. This is the growth of these middle class, middle income residents. And the real question is, is what can we do with those people who are getting richer and richer quite fast that we can shift things? It's the biggest growth sector, it's the most flexible growth sector, and they've got more, not less. Now, we all know politically it's a hell of a lot easier to do things when people are feeling that they're advancing than it is to do things when you're taking their toys away from them, even if they've got a lot of toys. So why white South Africans are always so grumpy? Okay? They've, got, they've got more than anybody else, way more. They can afford to give up, but no one likes to give up their goodies. Okay? The good news on this thing is that actually there is a constituency, probably many of us in the room are part of that, who are better off than our parents. That's much easier than working in the European context, where actually many kids are actually less well off than their parents. Shame, I don't feel sorry for them. They're very rich, okay? But it gives us some scope. What are the sorts of things, and that simply says the same sort of thing, simply about a percentage of distribution. The next couple of slides are intended to help us think about what it is that we can do, okay? which in a way is what's been going on in this room over the last little while. And I was intrigued, as I say, coming back to some of, 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 of these slides to think about them, because you will see some of the resonances. It seems to me that one of the things we need to do is we need to understand that 
the way that we can make, the way we can intervene in cities to make them fairer can be done at multiple scales. The first of which is a national scale. Okay? National policy does matter. And it matters because you can have, most importantly, you can have progressive taxation regimes. Do you or don't you have general sales tax? What is it? How is it structured? What's your minimum income? Because cities are so cash dependent, the fiscal system is absolutely critical and the taxation system is absolutely key. Similarly, large scale subsidies, particularly ones which mean that people don't have to spend money, like yours on food, on basic food, are really, really important. They matter probably more in urban contexts than they do in rural contexts. They don't make cities fair, but they begin to recalibrate some of those inequities, all those social grants. There are profound questions you may not have in the same way that we do, massive transfers around things like housing. Many countries do. We distribute a system defined at a national scale. You could do that at a number of scales, but national policies are, are one of them. And that's one of the most important ways that national governments intervene is by making decisions about which cities are the beneficiaries of investment. Now, we tend to think of this in terms of the growth debate. Okay? I, and and where the way that it's articulated is always around growth. Where should the port go? Okay? Where should the airport go? Where is it going to generate the most productive employment? But it is also <coughs> a question of where are the most deprived areas and what is the most useful thing? And it may not be that investing in the most deprived areas, what you do to make cities fairest. Okay? It may mean that to make cities fairest, you actually allow people to move between cities. So don't hear me wrong here. A national special policy doesn't necessarily invest only in deprived areas. And we can have a conversation about that because it's a very difficult area uh, to talk about. But national policy matters. And if you think, if you, if you try and avoid it by avoiding those questions, you invariably will land up reinforcing unfairness. So thinking about it is very important. For me, the most interesting thing, and in that's for this new cohort of people that we were talking about, is actually what you can do with the city state. Because these are urban residents, and in many of the cities of the global south, what we don't have is the kind of taxation. Billy lives in Brussels at the moment, and I would bet you that Billy's tax bill is higher than mine or yours. Okay? And the reason is, is that the middle classes in many affluent cities pay a significant, and particularly in Europe rather than in North America, pay a significant proportion of their income to level the playing field. Because if you assume that capitalism doesn't deliver equality, most of us believe that, then you need to do something about redistribution, right? Okay. So this redistribution question is absolutely fundamental. And leveling the playing field is fundamental. And cities make lots of decisions about that. Household services are probably one of the most important areas. Municipal tax policy, absolutely fundamental. How much you charge for water? Uh, <coughs> and where do you target special uh, intervention? So the city scale is really, really important. That's got a lot of attention and many of the sector specialists, that's where your consulting work happens, right? And you, you're doing projects on that in IIT. The stuff that I think gets left aside quite often is the stuff which falls into the indirect subsidy domain. Okay? It's the stuff on, of what creates universal good, what creates universal benefit. And the stuff which I think of here is stuff like, we had this debate uh, earlier this week, is does an efficient city work better for everybody, or does it only work better for the poor? Now, it seems to me that a city where there is a signpost and a street light on every street corner, not just in affluent areas, is one that works better for the poor. The rich typically, if it's something that's going to be useful to them, are able to provide it for themselves. And that's what you see in these gated communities, is people providing for themselves. Thank you, Miss David. There's a lot of water in my um, bag. Um, <coughs> so, universal services, collective services, and some of the ones that are hidden. Air pollution monitoring. <coughs> really good for poor people. Really good for everybody, but really good for poor people. 
mm, probably has a greater impact on the lives of poor people who aren't able to take protective mechanisms of filters, of living high. Similarly, water quality kinds of, of monitoring. So public services that do those sorts of things, we don't think of as pro-poor strategies, but it seems to me are absolutely foundational. The one that is my favorite is that last one, which is about what kind of knowledge do you hold about your city? Okay? Cities that work well for the poor understand where the money flows. They understand who's getting the benefit. <coughs> Cities that work well for the rich have typically been captured for the rich, and the knowledge about how the city works is captured. <coughs> Sorry, please excuse me. Let me have a plug. I would focus some of our attention on this indirect domain because it's much less well understood and because I think it has longer term consequences in thinking about fairness. Where I wouldn't focus, okay, and I've used the word welfare, and you see I put it in inverted commas because it's, it's, I, this is what I mean by this is not yet a published paper, so there's a slippage and the fair concept got allocated to me in a way. But what I'm not saying makes things fair, and this is where I'm, I'm taking issue with some of the literature, for example, on participation, okay, is I don't think that what the poor do for themselves, either individually or collectively, can be seen as a pro-poor strategy. Thank goodness poor people fight for themselves, but we shouldn't have to make them fight for themselves. Okay? For me, something which makes things fairer is something which is a collective decision which is done for morally justifiable reasons, which have to do with equity, not ones where we simply give over to people for things where they are getting what they should have got for themselves anyway in an equal distribution. So I really object to the idea that we leave the poor to fend for themselves and to fight for themselves. Similarly, I really don't think that we can look at services which the poor have to pay for as evidence in formal services quite often of fairness, particularly when those are run by gangs and landlords and others. Um, and so for that reason, I would see electoral and participatory democracy as endpoints. Note the electoral and participatory democracy as endpoints, <coughs> not as where we start. Yeah? Okay. The other thing I just wanted as a caveat is that this is a slide from David Suffolk, and I always want to acknowledge him on that. It's a point he makes, and I, and I value it. Basically, he says, the kinds of things that I've been talking about are all very well in places where these services are provided at a scale. Okay. In other words, I'm in, I'm, and that's why, in a way, what I'm talking to here is a middle-income context, not a ultra-poor context. These are countries where the levels of service provision, universal service provision, even to affluent areas, are so low that to begin to start talking about how you provide services is, and whether they are benefiting the rich, the poor is not particularly useful. In other words, if only 15% of the population are getting water from a municipal service provision, how it's costed is probably not particularly important in overall equity debate. And so I just want to acknowledge that. However, the context that we are talking about for many of us in middle-income countries, that is not the case. And we are getting higher and higher levels of coverage of particular kinds of services. And then those public policy debates really, really do uh, become really, really important. Really made the point uh, about that. I'm mindful of my time and I want us to have uh, some conversation as well. Um, now this doesn't come out maybe as clearly on the screen as it does on my computer, so I'm going to walk you through it. I'm not suggesting that only states are capable of ensuring that cities are fair. Okay. I do think, and I will go on to argue, that states have a particular role in that, but we, we know that there is no way where that is not the case, where, where states are the single agent, not even in Scandinavia. Okay. So who does provide the kinds of initiatives which make cities nicer, fairer places? It seems to me we've talked here about national state, national and local actors, but there are a whole lot of other actors at play. Where I come from, this is non-state actors, for example, traditional authorities. 
Now, I still haven't got my head around India and who controls land and or who controls some residual forms of power. But it's quite clear to me that just as in the case of England, we do have forms of residual or traditional authority. It may not be equal to those that exist in African cities. They may not have as a virtual role, but it continues to be a role. Where allocation questions, where protection questions, fall to, let's call them the elders. Yeah? Absolutely important. We absolutely know that civil society and religious groups are fundamental. Now, what the relationship is between those and political parties, which I incidentally haven't put on here, and perhaps should have done, really interesting, but we know that that's a very important factor. Then I've also put on here uncivil society, gangs. Because there are many households who depend for their protection when they fall below the public line, when they are in trouble, to gang leadership. And gangs do play that ambiguous role. They are both terror and protection. And understanding some of those kinds of dynamics seems to me to be very difficult in mediating fairness. It's quite often when we seek to put in new interventions, which would seem to be in the interests of particular communities, they say no. And we think that's because of the terror of the game. But sometimes, actually, it's because of the protection and the benefits that they receive may, in fact, outweigh what's being offered through some other system. So I think understanding some of that process is, is different. And local profiles of wealth <coughs> and inequity depend on the mix of the stuff. Okay. So I would imagine that how this plays out in Bangalore is very different from how that plays out in Delhi. Yeah? Certainly in the Cape Town context, it's very different from how it plays out in the context of Johannesburg. And making interventions around what will make things fair or not depends on not only understanding this mix, but understanding how it lands in the urban form, in the urban management system. Because each of these things is not an abstract political process and power base, but one that articulates with housing standards, water allocation, whether or not you have the ability uh, to claim the benefits which are due to you. So that's the one complexity that we have to take account of. The other, I've begun to suggest that making cities fair is not just a national prerogative of the state. Yeah? I've suggested in a way that what we need to do to make cities fair within cities is to start claiming urban public policy. And that's what we haven't done in the global south. Much, much better at doing than the global north. They're not brilliant at that. Um, and some countries are better than others. Countries like England are deeply centralized. The national government really determines everything. Other countries are much more decentralized, and there's a much greater understanding of what it takes to make your city fair. For us, what's really difficult is that we don't have very city identities. I don't know about you in India. My sense is, is that the big cities are OK. People know if they're from Bangalore or not. But when you move into those other settlements that are 100,000 people, 25,000 people, it's not clear whether they're urban or rural. It's not clear if they're from those places. It's, and some of that is because it's not clear who you are engaging with. Yeah? There's no administrative system as well as no identity about place. And it does seem to me that if we're going to have a collective identity, it has to be an urban identity. But you would argue that it has to be an identity we would define as cityness. Yeah? And perhaps you can pick up on that in some of those questions, but I think it gets to the heart of how do we begin to think about who's the inequity between? Am I better off than you? Is my allocation unfair relative to yours? Does depend on whether we see ourselves as being in the same place, of the same place. Um, and we know that we talk about that in national terms, but we also start having to think about it in urban terms. Okay. The other thing is that we have to start engaging with this full range of people who want to play in the space of making cities fairer. And almost everybody in that left-hand side here would articulate a vision, a utopian vision, of some degree of greater fairness. Now, either you say, no, roll over, this is my job, I'm the city manager, or you say, no, no, I really need to engage with you, okay? I need your help, because I can't do this on my own. 
So whether you are traders, whether you are religious bodies, whether you're business, your contribution to and your imagination of what would make a city fair is absolutely <coughs> crucial. And we need to make that visible and we need to harness it because one of the things which we really can do is to make everybody's contribution work better together. That would make and we need to start identifying the gaps. Skip that one. The difficulty is, is that there are some very real problems in depending only on people who put their hands up to say, I want to make this thing fairer. And it sounds terribly harsh and almost bitter, but I want us to walk through this slide quite carefully. Because I think it's only once we've begun to realize what some of the problems are, the limits to the current players wishing to make cities fair, that we begin to start rethinking what it is that we have to do. And the first thing it seems to me is that for almost any of those earlier players, religious bodies, do not believe in universal coverage. Okay? The Catholic Church will issue to somebody in need if they come into the Catholic Church. But they are very unlikely to run a program in an area that is not Catholic, okay? unless they are proselytizing. And that is true of almost every religion. It is not universal. The games are not universal. Business is not universal. So it's, it's subject also to ad hoc targeting, partly because those organizations themselves don't always have steady streams of money. It's not clear who's going to benefit. Maybe you'll get, maybe you won't get, and that in itself becomes unfair. First problem. It's certainly subject to what we would call clientelism, and we understand that. And I'm using the word donor here, not in the sense of TTZ or a donor. I'm using the sense of a benefactor. They have fashions. It also, do, in my view, depends too much on voluntarism, voluntary contributions. So the, the, those most in need, those most in need of protection, are reliant on the goodwill and presence of somebody else. It's not secure, in other words. It's also not based on need. Quite often it's the same group based. We talked about that in a way with the absence of universal coverage. It's almost always focused on individuals rather than groups. It's almost always focused on this generation, and it's almost never uh, focused on infrastructure or on the maintenance of infrastructure. So sometimes you will get a facility that is built, a school will be built, and sometimes really enlightened donors will run their school over an extended period of time. But it will typically be a school, not a system of schools. And if we think that getting access to schooling is important and a fundamental element of making cities fair, it will fall down in that regard. And it leads quite often to what I would call fragmented urbanism because it doesn't get to that stuff of in between spaces, stuff of that knowledge, the stuff about science, the stuff about what happens in the public domain. And so I think for that reason, because it is not universal, okay, so can you see where I'm going with this thing philosophically? does seem to me to say that if you get, begin to start talking about fairness, you do have to begin to start talking about what is universal. What do we all deserve? Whether we're living in the poorest city of Mongolia, or whether we're living in the richest city of Canada. What is universal? And it does seem to me that there are some real problems, and this is speaking very much from where I came from, where one system was never, or, or, or dual system was almost never equal. One, so we have the phrase, one system, one tax base. Because it needed that. It needed one system in order to have redistribution. It needed a whole bunch of those things. And so that takes me not to the universality of the state, but to a vision of fairness that has some absolutes. And some of those absolutes, it seems to me, rest with the state as a protector, if not a provider, facilitator and enabler, connector, but a point which we use as a clarion call in order to ensure fairness in our cities. And the difficulty with that is that what it does is that it makes the state a site of struggle, because states are not fair. We know that. Not just because they do things badly, but because they are subject to need capture, because they're constituted quite often for, to protect 
protect elite interests for any number of reasons which we understand. But if we ignore the state as a site of struggle, I think we ignore probably the most powerful instrument for beginning to ensure fairness. Now, I'm running way over time, so if you will indulge me, may I take another few minutes? If we are going to put the state as a site of struggle, it does seem to me we need to understand the state much better. And we don't understand the state at the urban scale. We generally don't understand the state in this global south. And probably the most important thing we don't understand is the most important thing that states do, which is that they manage money. And so I come back to this whole list of things which states do, which we need to understand. But I think I'm suggesting that we need to understand what states spend money on, the choices that states make sectorally about what is done, how they raise money as well as spend money. In other words, where are they borrowing from? And their emphasis on production versus redistribution. We've got to have a much more intelligent and much more sophisticated dialogue about public policy at the urban scale. And that, it seems to me, will take us to this discussion about how we make city spare. And that's been a very unfashionable thing to have within the literature of the global south, within the urban studies literature, for all sorts of kinds of reasons. And that's been for a whole range of, of, of we can have we can come up with a whole lot of explanations for that. The focus has been on the critique of the state, it's been on the concern about the retreat of the state, it's been seen on uh, the way that states are captured the focus <coughs> on corruption. And frankly it's also been an, an, an ignorance of what our southern reality is, and the fact that states in the south actually are, in some ways, sites of innovation. And so we put very little intellectual effort into thinking productively about what we might do. We haven't thought of that as an intellectual exercise. And I think, for me, what is so exciting about what you're doing at IIHS is that that's what you're doing. You're thinking about what can we do better. That is the intellectual task. And we can claim that space uh, and make that. We come back to this, I want to move us. Just to end on a reflection that it seems to me that this is a little of what we have been doing over the last few days. I'm intrigued when you look at goal 11 of the Sustainable Development Goals because this is an attempt to reach global consensus on our vision for a more sustainable, fairer future. Actually, if you unpack safe, inclusive, sustainable, and resilient, these concepts mean very, very different things. Okay? We have absolutely ideologically divergent, and they will lead to different interventions. It's going to get us into trouble in the medium term. But as before, it's been very powerful to have a normative base. Different people sign up to each of those things, and they each move us in the direction which says we want to make cities uh, fairer. And the brackets are ones that didn't make it uh, into the goal. But the real difficulty, the challenge, is not just in identifying the values and the norms, but in linking the practice. What are you going to do? How will you know when you've got there? And that's what the discussion is that we've been having in this room for the last three or four days. Which is about saying what are your targets and what are your indicators. And what will come to us in time to come is that question of saying, and how are you going to implement it? So, thanks, Eric. Wonderful, thanks. <laughs> thanks all. Um, responses, comments, questions. Just covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Who's going to go first? Uh, I just need a clarification of two points that you have mentioned. Uh, one, one slide which you are talking about, what to be excluded. When you, what to be excluded is a slide when you are talking about uh, the participatory and electoral uh, process of poor. So, but in any city when you look at, uh, unless we, uh, I don't know whether what I have understood correctly, what you have explained, 
if you exclude the poor or if you are not doing it when you talk about sustainability and fairness, over a period of time, the equity or say, social inclusion, exclusion would continue to grow. So how can, when we look at sustainable and uh, fair, any idea or a framework, go to your aside how we will be able to keep it aside. Point number two is you talked about every city we need to have their own identity. The, again, the notion of identity is quite fluid and how do we define? Because it, that's like you said, it's again contested. So when you talk about in India, except maybe the main urban metro cities, other cities do not have do not have clear identity. So just want to know how do we define that identity when we you know it's very difficult. Thank you. This idea, this urban identity question is one which is fascinating to me. Um, and and <coughs> my response to that is to say I'm not talking about my identity necessarily as being from Johannesburg, although I am a Joburg girl, mm -hmm. yeah, even though I'm not a big hater. That's who I am, and, and, and it shows in all sorts of ways. People who know can tell. And I can do the proper voice very quickly, and I can, and I can, I can be a Joburg girl. That's only part of it, though. For me, what's really important is that we begin to acknowledge ourselves as urban citizens in the way that Jane Jacob sort of said, or we were sort of suggested. Because once we recognize that we are urban citizens, then we begin to have a sense of entitlement of our place. Okay? In other words, there's something about what do cities deliver to us in general, not in particular, which is really important. And the reason that I say this is, is that, and again, I'm speaking very much out of the African context, but I, but I think, in fact, it's more common and more universal than this. Apartheid and colonialism tried to deny Africans the right to live in cities. It kept them out. It made them rural. They were not modern citizens. They were traditional. They were savage. They were not civilized. And I think there is something about modernity, urbanity, which is about those cluster of things. Which is, um, I'm not going over any other identity, but I think with that has to come certain things, like the right to walk on a pavement. Okay, if you live in a city for generation after generation after generation, and you may never go out on your own, you never have the right of being an urban resident. And that is true for me tens of millions of women. You can't do it. Certainly not at night. Okay. So that identity is coming. And until you think of yourself as an urban resident, you can't claim it. One of the things about living in a city is that that's what you need to be able to do in order to claim all of your rights. So, so that's what I mean by trying to think of ourselves not just as citizens of nations, but as citizens of cities in, in that very classic sort of sense. And when we do that, then what we need, what we expect, what is required for ourselves, for others, begins to be defined in a slightly different kinds of ways. So it's not just in the right to vote. It's, it is an arrangement. of things. It's about having a civil voice. It's about having a civil set of entitlements. And those are urban. So, so that's sort of what I mean, mean by that. I'm, I'm what I think I hear you saying on, on the earlier question, which is, is the issue about this intergenerational question of equity. Uh, why I find this really useful is that there's, there's a polarization which the sustainable development people try to bridge with their social, economic, and environment. But actually the truth is, is that there's a philosophical conflict for many between managing cities in ways that do not compromise resource integrity and managing cities for environmental justice reasons. And the problem is, is that we talk about it in the environmental justice terms, which are very much about contemporary allocations of resources and access and distribution of, of, of privilege, of environmental privilege. Okay? Are you located near to a waste dump or not? Okay. And that's how we sort of get everybody on board onto a green agenda. Whereas it seems to me the much more significant question we should be asking is, is the way we are building a city today in the interests of three generations' time? Will it be fair? Is what we are getting out of cities the same as what 10 generations' time will get out of cities? Some of them will get better 
allocations than we will, okay? because we would have paid for infrastructure. Some of them, and this is what Europe's facing at the moment, will not. Their future generations will have to pay for the infrastructure that we are benefiting from now. So for me, that intergenerational question of equity is really important because of the way we use natural resources in the city, but also the way we finance the way that we build cities. And I don't think we've spent nearly enough time thinking about that interface. Um, it's very, very difficult to do. But that intergenerational question does seem to me to be really important. So, and why I don't like a lot of the literature that purports to be pro poor is when you think of fairness rather than being pro poor when you're being pro poor you walk into a slum and it's very easy to work out what you should do. You respond to the person in front of you, right? When you start thinking about what's fair, you may come up with a very different uh, solution. And, and so that's why I like the idea of thinking about fairness, not just production, because it does take us to different implementation packages. Hi, I'm Mekha. Um, so I uh, had a question around, uh, is there evidence, growing evidence that uh, indicates the changing value systems? You spoke particularly about the rising middle class, um, a generation which has more than the parents did. And this is usually the class that is moving to cities, especially India's specific context. So is there evidence which shows the changing value systems of this growing class has a bearing and is also changing the way you identify as an urban dweller or a city dweller and therefore that's playing a huge role in how cities of the future are going to uh, develop. And Bangalore, I see, is a good example. So is that Fascinating. Look, I think some of the, some of the cultural studies people are way ahead of us. Um, and people who study music and youth culture, um, they get it. It's urban culture. It's, it's, it's in, you know, it, it, it really is understood as quintessentially urban. practice. What I don't think we understand is the elite of the cities that develop software in them. Um, we were talking about this last night. Is that what, not only what does it mean to become an overnight uh, when you and your previous generation, that, uh, you're different from every generation that's been before you, but what does it mean to be a middle class overnight living in Lagos? It's very, very different. And what does that mean when you have that at scale? Um, and, and what can we seriously be expecting of those constituencies and how, why and how can we get them to look at the issue of fairness? Okay. Because perhaps the people who are perpetrating the most significant unfairness at the moment are in fact those middle class residents. So let me take my own case as an example. I quite often put a, a, a photograph of where I live, which is very beautiful, and around the corner from me is an Okay. I'm absolutely typical of that constituency, and that's why I use the example of actually the people who we typically think of as being part of the global elite, Europeans, actually probably are perpetrating quality less than I would. And I think we don't understand that, that relationship within cities, I'm not sure that we understand fully. So your point is absolutely valid. Can please some of you work on the middle class? Can you please work on the elite? Can you please work on what it is that we can do? Not because you, you create fairness through two things, right? You give to the poor, but you also have to take from the rich. And I think many middle class people would say, I'm very happy for you to give to the poor, but don't take from me. No. So that seems to me we need to be able to work on mechanisms for why that's important. And that's where the natural resource question seems to me to be important. I like the idea of having maximum standards. Nobody may consume more water or land. Nobody or energy. But you can pay for it. You may not. Um, because that's what's fair. Or even carbon space. Oh, yeah. This is me about talking about plan. <laughs> Any other yeah, sure, So you mentioned, um, uh, in your opinion, citizenship and early citizenship is sort of a uh, way to, towards more ties and sort of connected to, to a land or um, you know, benefits associated with that. But 
the way I'm thinking about it is also that citizenship of one place also denies you access to other places. It's almost exclusion to other places which is what is going on in China. And some locations by the virtue of the natural resources or uh, you know, just the, the, the location of where they are, they are just generally more vulnerable. So what what are the dangers of having such an issue? I mean, this, this is something that we see anyway. Um, yes, you are. And you put it in a way I've never heard articulated before, and I, and I think what you're saying is is really important for understanding an urban world. In other words, when, when we are all urban citizens, what do we, how do we think about our collective contributions to fairness and non-fairness? Um, and the way that I've thought about it, which is nowhere near as articulate as what you've just said, is, is people often talk about it's the rise of the city in Asia that drives what happens in Africa. Okay? So, the simple, Asia's footprint, Asia's urban footprint is not here, and it's not even in your immediate catchment. Okay? That's easy to think about. But actually, it's elsewhere. Um, and maybe that goes to your, your point about how do we think of ourselves? Well, how do we think of ourselves as a quote unquote civilization? What is the 21st century, and what does it mean to be in an urban world? And there's a fascinating academic debate going on um, about planetary urbanism. Okay, um, so, so planetary urbanism, for those of you who are not following that, some people think it's a silly concept, it's a one line concept, and it basically says everything is urban. So whether you're in the sky or in the ocean, the boundary of the city extends into everything we can imagine. Okay? There are other people who, who use a slightly different phrase and they talk about urban pathways, which comes much more out of the science and the same things, which is about how the fact of cities changes everything. Okay? And by that logic, that boundary question is much less important. You can still bound your city because you can still be in Bangalore recognizing that Bangalore is transformative of a range of processes, some of which happen in Bangalore and some of which are beyond it. So, and, and that has real implications for fairness and our use of resources. Um, if everything is everywhere, then it, it's only our collective identity as urbanized, it's our universal urban identity. If it is a more localized one, then actually it's also our place-based one. But, so I think that debate is going to be an interesting one in, in shaping how power can. You can tell me which side I come down. <laughs> um, hi. Um, you had mentioned that the state is one of the most important sites of struggle in looking at this issue of fairness. Um, quite often, uh, we are thinking that the private sector are um, important resources for the state in terms of you know, financial resources. So I have, um, I, there were two questions that I wanted to ask. One was uh, about the private sector's involvement in particularly with their corporate social responsibility um, uh, schemes that they, uh, the agenda that they have. Um, how have they in your experience, if at all, contributed towards this fairness? And the second is about the role of the civil society and how strong have they been? Um, you did mention that they're pretty much uh, resorting to addressing groups and specific groups and may not necessarily um, be universal. But uh, are there examples where civil society would have actually contributed strongly? Um, so on the question of, of the private sector, um, and, I, and I like, I'm in Bangalore, so I'm going to use the example of IT. <laughs> um, I think when we said that the state is a site of struggle, um, I don't know, that doesn't say who has to be doing fighting. Um, and it's very clear to me that, that business will be one of the constituencies that will be doing the fighting, and they may not always protect elite interests. It is perfectly possible for business to push a progressive agenda, and in some cases it's in their interests to do so. Um, but I think we need a, a, an articulate normative base collectively in, or, in order for that to happen. And I'll give you an example. 
probably the most important thing that is happening at the moment between the private sector and the state is the discussion of what IT systems are selected to run cities, okay, the smart cities debate. And they, they talk about IT lock-in, like you know, like you get concrete lock-in, that you get IT lock-in. Okay, so which system you use? The question for me is, is the system that you design capable of redistribution or not? Okay, it's all very well collecting your billing money coming in, but can you actually then reallocate it? Do you know where the poor people are that you're trying to actually pass it on to? So, for example, so the kinds of questions that business is able to ask of and provide for and be responsive to, but you need people in the state, which is the car, I always use it as an example of a site of struggle, you need unbelievably clever people in government to be able to sit down with the seniors and say, no, I'm very sorry, that is not the system that we want. Redesign the system so that it can do A, B, and C, because that's what states do as opposed to what business does. So, so, so that could be my sort of civil, the, the state kind of, uh, the private sector uh, kind of thing. On the civil society thing, um, I, I heard an interview on the radio the other day which has stuck with me because it, it articulated well for me. And I am not saying we do not need active civil society. We do. We actually have in the global south extraordinarily active civil society. In fact, I, we, oh, we have an overburdened civil society because the state doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So civil society does an awful lot of its work for it. One of the difficulties for me with that, though, is that what we've done is, is that we've abandoned political parties. Okay? So we've got this whole edifice of democracy where we vote governments in and out, and then we rely on civil society to hold them to account, but we should actually be holding the political party to account. Now, it's nowhere near as much fun to be involved in a political party as it is to be involved in civil society. But probably we've got the emphasis slightly wrong then. I don't know what we think about political parties and whether they are part of civil society or not, or whether they're part of the state. Um, so, so for me, that point would be to say, can we rethink the relationship between, not so much between states and civil society, because it's clear to me what states should be doing. They should be holding civil society, the states to account. But rather between civil society and political party, we do have democracy. Because that's a very different kind of mechanism. And what then is the relationship between the party and the state becomes very important. So it's a roundabout, I don't know if that. Yeah. Um, so I completely agree with you on this day that we should be more of a problem and focus from a global angle to a competition of that aspect as well. Look, look at the implementation packet and uh, the question that you put out about two last two slides about what would do better to manage and then it's there. So if you ask the, what should we do to increase that sort of support, it's a very different question from asking let's look at the entire chunk of money that we have. And can we redirect some money? Can we not redirect it to be absolutely to do it's by that thing? But I don't, at least in the agency, I don't think those questions are being asked. The questions are very much still, you know, what can we do to get away quality. That comparative question, I can almost see it being CLC just being live and very, you know, all that. So the question is, you know, how is it in South Africa or any other markets that have been dealt with? And what, do you, what is required in the policy frame, you know, with the government to actually make that shift to ask those kind of questions from both what the questions of them? I mean, I, I suppose in the most provocative interpretation of this, we would actually argue that proposed strategies are elite capture. Okay? In other words, that you top slice 5%, 10%, okay, you have 10%, and you give that to the poor, and then the system runs. Um, and, and what, what, what really like this question is this idea that actually what we really need to look at is understand the entire system <coughs> and understand who's getting what and ensure that it is equitable. Um, What's really nice about political transitions is that everything comes up for review. <laughs> um, just, in other words, so when you shift from a, an apartheid government to a post-apartheid government, you've got an excuse to look at the whole system. Unfortunately, we didn't understand the whole system in all of its mechanisms. <laughs> and so everything, we weren't able to maximize, I don't think, the places where we really could do things differently. But, but there were examples, and, and Billy, I'd be really if you, if you came in on this, because you were a major player in some of these things. Um, Billy was the 
what you can pick this up, and I'm going to put this mouth. But where I think we were able to make major interventions is where we use the whole system. So like changing the tax base, um, or uh, making a universal system uh, of access to pensions. Um, in other words, just everybody through that process. So there's a huge technical literature about targeting, and I think quite often when you go to universal systems, you actually land up with better, more equitable systems than, than you do when you've got targeted ones. Um, so we can have that discussion. But do you want to comment on that? I mean, you, you've got a great example. Well, if you ask me to comment, you're not really sure what I'm going to comment on. <laughs> so just some general comments um, about the whole notion of, of fairness cities. Um, I really like the presentation and it provoked me to make uh, a number of observations. Uh, your first challenge is, is, is... Sorry, but you, people have no clue sorry. why you were talking to this transition. Oh, sorry. So, it's because I'm staying at the back. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> just, just tell us. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I was um, the Director General. I, I ran an NGO in South Africa, which became the biggest urban NGO. Um, just before the transition, and we did daily work around city issues uh, as advisors to community organizations, trades unions, and civic organizations. And for those of you who have not really thought about apartheid, it, it fundamentally was a battle around demographics of urbanization, of course, played through race. And it was fundamentally managed at the local level. Although you had national policy, it was administered by cities. So the city fight became absolutely essential. Of course, multiple city fights, and that's why it became a national movement. That's a very short path. And I was involved in the design of the housing policy for South Africa um, for the African National Congress and ended up uh, as the Director General, which is the senior civil servant for the government. And we were trying to redress the, the backlogs, which are uh, four or five or eight generation, uh, eight decades of, of housing policy had created. So uh, I'm very familiar with a lot of the themes, um, and I now currently run the Cities Alliance, and uh, where we say we have a global focus on slums and cities, and, and hopefully uh, a forward-looking agenda for cities, which is really what 2015 is about. And why we'll be meeting next week, and why we are. I don't care how you tell me it is, if we've got a target, we can use it. And so we'll, we'll take it and run. Um, so just to comment on, on, on this whole discussion, and, and the difficulties of, of uh, putting forward a campaign or a notion of fairness. First of all, you're dealing with the economies where the city itself is not how people think as an organizing feature of their life or society. They're much more likely to think in India about the state government and about the national government. And they don't necessarily, as true in Africa, well, they think of city at the level of organization or contestation. They always look upwards first rather than across, which is what you have to do at a city level, and even more likely <coughs> downwards, which is to the population, which are a bit excluded. Uh, just some additional comments. Your, the, the concept of fairness here is focusing on fairness within cities. Uh, that, of course, raises immediately the danger that you can have different fairnesses in different cities. And so the question is that is why it has to be multi layered so that there is an element of. Uh, because you can't have fairness within cities, but not fairness It's not that every city has to be the same, because as a person I've always argued before, cities have been able to do things differently. They have to be able to do the same thing, so you can achieve fairness differently, but fundamentally there must be an equivalence of fairness in broad terms. Um, and I think the, the difficulty in a country like India, which does is that a lot of people may not know what you're talking about when you propose that the city is fundamentally unfair. You first of all, you have two responses, life's unfair and city's unfair, so what get on with it and, and, and fix it. And the other one is a key element is getting the same citizens in the same city to have a common understanding about what happens in that city. So the, what we would support is very much a, a know your city campaign. So what price do the poor pay for water per litre and what price do the rich pay in the same city is the sort of data. What is the, how do administrations respond to the poor or to women and how is it different? You need facts on the table 
both facts of quantity and facts of quality of, of city response in order to turn, because the very way this works is you turn it into a campaign about achieving fairness, you first of all have to demonstrate very boldly the unfairness of the system. And of course, I think this is where institutions like IHS can, uh, can come in. And I will pay much more attention to the failure of um, public governance where it leads to the emergence of parallel markets, by which I mean where the public authority through its unfairness or the results doesn't service 30 or 40 or 56 percent of the population, they have to seek alternative solutions. And the end result of that is not only more expensive water, electricity, and transport, but might ultimately, as we saw in Cape Town, as we see in Rio de Janeiro, end up with a parallel system of governance, which is that you have different authorities running the same system. And so the responses, and I think there's a huge argument, which is very imperfectly understood by the administrations. They just assume that those that aren't being served are off the equation and don't need to be worried about. And of course, in India, as in other countries like in Nigeria, you have one of your ingrained difficulties is, of course, you have a historically very hostile attitude of the middle classes to the poor. They are aggressively not in favor of the poor being around. They are very much in favor of being serviced by the poor but not in seeing them and helping them. And it's that's, it's that's the narrative that needs to change. And that's why I think there's two responses to the fairness. The one is there's a sort of social justice, which is I didn't, I didn't realize that it was so bad, and, I, and naturally we must fix that. Uh, but I think the, the other argument, which is often the more compelling one, is to demonstrate that it is extremely inefficient to have this level of, of inequality in the city and that the net impact is to drag down the, uh, the ability of the city itself for everybody. And that is, and I think there's a combination of arguments. One, I think, was never up on the social justice argument, which is a human rights and, and a equality of treatment, whether it's whatever the like that is. But the other one, really, because in a lot of cities, and I'll bet it's the case here, you will find out that the rich pay the least towards the cost of the city and the poor pay the most. Quantifying that and then having a public debate saying, is this the kind of city we want and how efficient is it is, is a, a, a very strong way forward in, in the argument. So I think it's a I think it's a, a very likely that this really needs the facts on the table because you have to have a public debate about it. And just to underscore that I mean, it's the facts about the city. So, so you have to have an imagination that cities are places that can mediate and, and, and can arbitrate what becomes fair or not fair. And I think that that's what actually hasn't been in our consciousness. Okay. You have to actually imagine that the city is a determinant of unfairness and can be a progressive force in making things fair. And in order for that to be the case, the city is. So, so for people who are interested in social justice, Actually, until you understand how the city works, and to answer your question very specifically, the places that we did best at were the places where we understood what the sources of injustice were. The places that we did worst at, and which remain rise of inequality, are the places where we didn't understand. So I think, for example, we did not understand zoning schemes. We did not understand building codes. Technical things, really, really technical questions. We didn't understand what they did, we didn't understand where they came from, and we didn't understand why they made people's lives very, very unfair. Um, and, and pricing of services. Um, and it takes time, you get, you know, you, you, and you need real expertise. And a lot of the stuff is it's deeply embedded. Um, it's deeply, deeply embedded. And we go, that's how we understand how the city works. Because until you can understand how the city works, you cannot make the city. Any other questions? Any other comments? This might be a little bit of an unfair question, uh, but how does uh, how does this notion of fairness, in your in your view, uh, extend to outside the city? Right? I mean, and you sort of just mentioned this briefly, and how the city is a cycle where fairness ideas of 
I mean, the, the, the mere production of cities themselves might be creating unfair situations for people who are outside them. So, I mean, how, how do you think of this idea outside the city and more widely? I think that's really an underground floor. So I've, I've got a bit of debate about that, that planetary urbanism kind of question. So, so for me, this gets to the more macro questions of social justice. So, and it's that question of, uh, do we need a, a universal understanding of rights? <coughs> because I think if we have a universal understanding of rights, it begins to define what we mean within and between cities. Um, and so I, I'm quite happy to begin to look at the cognizant of what it takes to live in a city. Um, in other words, for me, what I feel about some of the stuff I'm going to is that it's defined in terms of access to political information and the right to vote. It's defined sometimes in terms of things like, and, and this is where this process is so absolutely crucial, it lands at being defined in terms of monetary policy and monetary levels of a dollar a day or a dollar twenty-five a day. And if that doesn't address the realities of urban life, we haven't got to the difference between urban and rural. So, counter to what everybody thinks, I suspect that the people who are most at risk from not thinking about a universal understanding of fairness are probably the urban poor, not the rural poor, at least in the 21st century. Um, in other words, because of the emphasis on money uh, and the, the, the lack of money, at least the rural poor have access to some form of subsistence in many places. And I don't, to be honest, I don't think urban versus rural question, but, but I'm thinking about what are those universal minimums I think we have to actually check to say, does it work in a cold place? Does it work in a rich place? Does it work in an urban place? And does it work in, in, a, in a rural place? And then if we can do that, I think it helps us get to that. So, yeah, does it work for old? Does it work for young? Some of those sorts of questions. Any other comments, responses? Great, wonderful. Thank you. So that was a great conversation. And we hope to have you back soon enough. And we hope to have many of you back. We'll continue this lecture series over this month and next month. Thanks for coming.